evening. I am uh, welcome to the Thursday, November 8th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Darkowitz. Um, I will uh, begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. <coughs> Mr. Alden Bourne. Here. Ms. Blue Duvall. Present. Mr. Michael Flynn. Here. Mr. Downey Meyer. Present. Ms. Lisa Minnick. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Stephanie Pick. Here. Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Mr. Ed Zahowski. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Excellent. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Um, I get the list. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I brought my timer tonight uh, just so that we can keep the time. Um, so that everyone uh, has an equal amount of time to speak. So I'll ask you to state your name and address for the record. Um, and uh, Jeff, you're the first speaker. I'm Jeffrey Buber, live at 35 Fruit Street in Northampton. I thank the school board for all these hearings. While I am in favor of later start time, I'm also mindful of the conflict this will arise with the Northampton Rec Department and the fiscal viability of the Aquatic and Family Center. And all of you have got to bear that in mind before you make any rash decisions and find it out. Because we may find out, like Amos did, keep the status quo or lose all sports <coughs> except football and basketball. Time to find out the opinion of the Rec Recreation Department <coughs> now before you make the final vote. I know kids need extra hours sleep or good breakfast, but we have a unique feature here in this beautiful swimming pool, and I don't know anybody, including <coughs> those involved in high school swimming, want to see that financial viability of this pool jeopardized. Take it under consideration. Thank you. Kid. Thank you very much. The next uh, speaker uh, that's signed up is Christine Young. Hi, I'm Christine Young. I'm at 1443 West Road. Um, hi, I've never been here before, but I know a lot of you. Um, my credentials for being here are that I have five teenagers living in my home. Um, I have a senior who goes to Northampton High School, a sophomore at Northampton High School, and I have three eighth graders one at JFK, and two eighth graders at uh, PVPA. So I'm actually sort of uniquely equipped to answer this question is, does it matter if your kids get extra sleep in the morning? Because I live with a variety of people, and I can tell you that the kids that go to PVPA, and this will be anecdotal, nobody's doing research in my home, um, that these kids get up, the two PVPA kids get up at 7.15, they leave at quarter of eight, they get to school at 8.30. They either get driven or they take a bus. They eat breakfast. I don't go to PVPA to drop off things that those kids have forgotten. Is that a coincidence or what? But they have more time in the morning. They're more clear-headed. They're more coherent. They do tend to eat uh, breakfast. I'm on a first-name basis with all the secretaries at Northampton High School. And why is that? That is because the, the other kids get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. The bus comes at 6.34, and I tell you that number not to be a nitpicker, because if they're not outside at 6.34, the bus leaves, because she's only got a minute to wait for them, because she's got to get them to the high school for 7 o'clock, where they can sit for half an hour. This isn't great, you know, this isn't great for these kids. They're getting dropped off at 7 for start time at 7.30, and I, they do forget things. So anyway, I'm just here to say that I'm very much in favor of a stronger, uh, of a later uh, start time at the school. And I also thank all of you, and I don't envy you, but I also will say that someone who hasn't been here speaking but has been following this as a parent and a community member, I think it's really close to making a decision. Uh, people need to have a decision from you, so thank you. Thank you. The next speaker who signed up is Jonathan Schwab. <clears throat> Did you sit 
My name is Jonathan Schwab. I'm a pediatrician at Northampton Area Pediatrics and have been in practice for over 20 years. I'm here as a representative of the seven other pediatricians and two nurse practitioners who I work with. Collectively, we take care of a vast number of the children in the Northampton public school system. I am not here to tell the school board how you should vote. I am here as a concerned physician who has studied this issue and I'd like to tell you what I've learned. My children are grown up, so I have no vested interest in this outcome of the decision other than the benefit and well-being of the patients and families I take care of. To understand this issue, one must first understand some of the basics behind sleep and adolescent growth. As children go through their pubertal growth spurt, several biochemical changes do occur. Among this is a delayed secretion of melatonin, resulting in delayed onset of sleep and delayed wakening. The delay is about one hour. This biological change is specific to our human species and seen throughout different cultures as shown through studies from Japan, Brazil, Australia, and China. These studies were performed in the early 1990s, well before the introduction of the internet or cell phones. What is very clear is that the delayed onset of sleep, something that just about any parent of a teenager has observed, is a biological phenomenon not created by society or as a result of multiple media exposures. But the question remains, does delaying the start of the high school day really result in additional sleep for these students, or will they just sleep in later? This question has been studied in multiple ways, and the answer is that students get more sleep if they're not required to wake up as early. In aggregate, I estimate from several different studies that almost a minute of sleep is gained for each delayed minute of sleep in delayed school time. Again, because this is a biological problem and sleep is a biological process, the students tend to go to sleep around the same time but are able to sleep in and wake up later. The next logical question is, does an extra hour of sleep really make a difference in their lives? This also has been studied and the conclusion is yes. Studies from a multitude of communities not dissimilar to our own, as well as cross-cultural studies from Poland, Iceland, Canada, Israel have shown that delaying start times and the corresponding increase in sleep result in improved attendance, less tardiness, improved academic performance, improved alertness, improved mood, and less symptoms of anxiety and depression. Other studies have even shown less automobile accidents and improved athletic performance. These studies have been so convincing that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the governing medical society that often writes guidelines for pediatricians, will be releasing a policy statement on this issue. I have communicated with that author of that statement and she has confirmed that the AAP will endorse later starting times for all high schools throughout the country. We understand the difficult decision that the board has to make. Change is always difficult and we are sure that it would be a hardship for many people. But when evaluating the pros and cons of such a decision, it is most important that the board has a clear understanding about the data regarding the benefits of a delayed start and the data clearly shows that students benefit significantly from such a change. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Schwab. <laughs> the next speaker is Linda Finlay. Hi, my name is Linda Finlay. I live at 39 Clare Avenue in Florence. Um, I have a student at the high school and I have a student at Leeds Elementary School. Um, I've attended the, the forums and I went last night but I actually um, want to talk about the attachment of the extended elementary school day to the late start. And I think it's confounding the issue, and I have a real problem with that. And I think for that reason, I think what we need to do is pull the two things apart. I think we're talking about apples and oranges, and they shouldn't be together. And I think you need to have that conversation with the community, the principals, the staff, teaching staff, the families, about extending that elementary school day. Um, you know, we all, more sleep is a good thing, but I think you've added this other layer that is confusing the issue, and I would urge the um, school council to sort of put the brakes on and separate the two issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Kim Lutz. Hi, my name is Kim Lutz, 291 Hayden Hill Road, Leeds, and I have uh, a daughter who is a sophomore at Northampton High and a recent graduate from Northampton High. And uh, what I've thought about in you all making this decision is one, that it affects 
potentially every single family in the school system. And my big question is, while there are many, many factors that affect student success in school, I think the biggest factor is the teachers. And we have excellent teachers in our school system. We are so, so lucky to have the wonderful teachers we have. And my understanding is the teachers have been census about this issue. Uh, <coughs> Once, some time ago, once fairly recently, my understanding is that the teachers are not in favor of this change, and I just have to think the teachers who are in the classroom day in, day out with these kids, who observe the kids, who observe uh, <coughs> the the uh, quality of education, and who are the experts. I'm not an expert; they are. I would uh, urge you to take their opinion into consideration as you make this decision. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Marielle Lutz. Marielle. Hi, I'm Marielle Lutz. I live at 291 Haydenville Road in Leeds. Um, my biggest problem with the late school start is that it affects a lot of kids and a lot of kids who are athletes. Um, track athletes, specifically indoor, which constitutes over 10% of the student body, there are over 100 kids who participate in track. They lose the opportunity to use Smith's indoor facilities. Because of the late school start, we wouldn't get to use them. So that's a huge loss to a large part of the student body. Not just runners, but a large cross section of everyone in NHS. Also, kids who participate in sports or of jobs or of extra curricular activities outside of school lose time with teachers because they don't get to stay after as long. They don't get to have that half an hour, hour, however long it is, to stay after with teachers because they have to go somewhere else and get to other obligations. And when people say that sports aren't as big a deal as we're making them out to be, sports are a pretty big thing because we learn lessons in school, we go and then we practice and we learn how to f fail, succeed, work hard, try. It's something that's a, it's a lot easier for us to care about because we're not sitting in the classroom. And the majority of students and teachers don't want this change and I don't think we should be forcing a change that af greatly affects people who don't want the change to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Cindy Mahoney. Good evening. My name is Cindy Mahoney. I have students um, at the high school, middle school, and Lean's kindergarten. My hope for this evening is that the issue of later start and dismissal times will finally be put to rest because this has gone on longer than a Florida ballot recount. <laughs> at last night's forum, I spoke about NHS's schedule being solidly in the middle of area public school start times. I'm happy to share that data with anyone should you wish. We've heard repeatedly that studies have shown that some teenagers have different sleep rhythms. That's not the case in our house. However, both the CDC and healthcare organizations highlight other ways families can mitigate this without interfering with school start and dismissal times. Family meal times are part of that equation, and many studies also show a clear link between family meals and students' improved academic achievement, reduced substance abuse, and healthier eating and overall well-being. If this dismissal time is shifted later, that will adversely impact family meal times. In our household, if the older kids are getting home later because of later dismissal times, that means later family dinner time for the youngest. Our youngest is one who works very hard throughout the school day, and we're grateful for the support that she has received in doing so. She is also a child who thrives under routine, and one of those routines is dinner with her sisters. If she will be arriving home later in the afternoon, already tired from a longer day, and her older siblings are getting home even later because of the later dismissal time, that will have a detrimental effect on her physically, emotionally, cognitively, and behaviorally. There is one group I wish to speak of, speak on behalf of this evening, and that is the English language learner population here in Northampton. My master's degree and certification are in pre-K through 12 ESL, but most of my work has been teaching adult immigrants and refugees at the International Language Institute here in Northampton. On days when I think my logistics are overwhelming, I'm brought right back to <coughs> earth when I remember the juggling that these families do. I am quite honestly terrified what will happen to the working lives of these families who rely so heavily on their high school sons and daughters to care for their younger children. The child care that these adolescents provide to their siblings is what allow their parents to take on extra shifts, whether by choice or necessity. If the bus schedules are simply flipped and older children arrive home after the younger children, 
these families will be forced into a dire situation. In these tough economic conditions, with the looming federal physical cliff, later start times and dismissal times for Northampton High School are a luxury that neither municipal nor family budgets can afford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jennifer McKenna. My name is Jennifer McKenna. I live at 89 Florence Street in Leeds. First, I want to thank you for all you do for our kids. Louder, please. Um, last night's fifth forum on the high school start issue made a couple of things clear. First, we need a working committee charged with addressing the nitty gritty details Excuse of this change. Excuse me. Could you speak a little bit louder? And second, we have an abundance of community expertise that can be harnessed for this change. Most, much of the forum last night was re a recycling and refuting of misinformation about the research and extent of the problem in Northampton, a litany of reasons why a change will be uh, challenging, and people speculating about how a change will affect them personally. But the forum also revealed administrators, parents, and students who want this change for the well-being of our kids and who have concrete input that could ease implementation, including some who spoke against the change during the forum, but in conversations afterwards said they want the change but are worried about the logistics. Since January, when you directed the superintendent to come up with a later start time plan, we have had free-ranging forums about the benefits and challenges, but no effort to systematically develop a plan that would address the, the challenges identified at many of the forums. It's time to channel people's good energy and ingenuity into hashing out a plan that actually addresses the issues that have been repeatedly raised. There's no question this can be done with a mandate and a stakeholder group with the mission to create the plan. This fall, when the Department of Public Health advised canceling evening outdoor activities due to the EEI risk, local sports programs were able to make and coordinate changes to their practice and game schedules within a matter of days. Though not without challenges and hassles and some cancellations due to the sudden need to act, but families willingly adjusted their schedules and managed the ripple effects on other, on other activities. I would also note the EEI virus was a potential health threat. The sleep deprivation many of our high schoolers suffer is a present ongoing threat to their health and safety. In sum, I request that you authorize formation of a committee of school and community stakeholders tasked with working out the nuts and bolts of implementing the change you adopt tonight or tasked with coming back before January 15th before the busing RFP goes out with a detailed plan for implementing an 815 and or 830 high school start time in 2013. Four year, years ago, a committee of school, sports, and community folks <coughs> was formed to determine if this change should be made. They unanimously recommended a change to 8.30 or later. Many from the committee who determined that this change should happen are obvious resources for a late start committee to now determine how it will happen. This summer, parents with expertise in the busing and sports issues offered to help the superintendent tackle the challenges of implementation. That resource has not been harnessed. Community members stand ready to devote their time, smarts, and expertise to help you to realize this important change. Some have already figured out how to implement the 815 proposal with no change to the JFK start time. Please create a late start committee to move us from discussion to implementation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Horwitz. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Mark Horowitz. My daughters attend NHS. My understanding is that the committee recently instructed the superintendent to meet with constituencies about number three and number four. My understanding is also that having done that, my impression is that most teachers oppose number three or number four. Most students oppose number three and number four. The administrators, your, all your school principals oppose number three and number four. At the meeting last night with parents talking about three and four, elementary school uh, parents rejected three and four for their reasons. Many high school parents rejected three and four. And there were some, of course, parents of high school students who thought either three or four would be a good idea. And what I'm trying to sort out for myself, though my position on this has been clear, is if we all accept the general premise of the brain research studies, nobody's arguing with this, and we all care about our teens, why haven't we been able to come up with a specific workable plan that's got consensus in over five years? My own view is that it's because of the very real unintended negative consequences of the change, which is what always happens in policy changes. The benefits of the change, I think, are somewhat hypothetical. The following negative unintended consequences would begin in our system the first day we implement this change. 
Number one, teens will lose some of their after school time with teachers and that access helps them learn, builds their commitment to the school and builds their commitment to their studies. That's going to be lost day one, some of it. Teams involved, number two, in performing arts, sports, paid employment and caring for younger siblings will get a later start on these activities and they're going to spend less time on something because at some point the day will end. Less time on their studies, less time with their families. Everything's going to start later. Number three, it's, it's, it's very clear that teens are going to lose athletic opportunities and the remaining opportunities are going to cost more money. Jim Miller made a statement to many people about the extra busing costs that will be incurred if we make this change. Number four, this amazing free enrichment opportunity that some kids use of being able to take courses at Smith College is going to be substantially compromised. Smith professors have, have testified to that here. And it's a great cost savings for our system that we don't have to pay for some of the kind of courses that a place like Amherst offers in the school. And number five, many families within and beyond the high school are going to be adversely affected by these changes. Plus, there's many scheduling changes within the elementary school themselves. These are all things that people have been saying. I think it's difficult to find a workable solution because the harm is just greater than the good. And I think that, the, uh, quite honestly, I think that the easier thing to do tonight is a momentum building. The easier thing to do in the face of very, very fierce advocacy to make this change is, is to just say yes, we'll make a change and we'll work out the details. But the devil is in the details. And the harder thing to do that our high school principal modeled last night is to say, I agree with the principal, the costs are too great, we can't make this change. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sharon Carlson. My name is Sharon Carlson. I'm the president of uh, NACE, which is the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I'm here to speak about um, the fact that the educators, both at the middle school and the high school, were polled over 60% wanted no change because of the devils in the details and not knowing exactly what that would be. And also, I recently heard from my elementary colleagues who are very concerned about um, the fact that 20 minutes were, was added onto the schedule in the elementary day without negotiation, not knowing what those details would entail. And they don't want to be um, the devil, per se, when you've picked three or four and changed their schedule, and then they say, I'm sorry, but we're not going to add 20 more minutes to our day. Not saying they would, because we don't know what the details are, but they don't want to be thrown under the bus, pun intended. <laughs> so um, I think if you're going to do whatever you're going to do, one, you have to think very carefully about the details and the effects that it will have for a later start time. And two, that realistically, the 20 added minutes to the elementary schedule should not even be part of this discussion right now. Thank you. The next speaker is Harvey Hill. Hope I'm reading that correctly. My name is Harvey Hill, <clears throat> excuse me. I live at 65 Paradise Road in Northampton. I, my older son, Benjamin Hill, is a sophomore at the high school, and my younger son, Nicholas, uh, should enter Northampton High next year as a freshman. I have not spoken on this issue before now, but I decided to speak tonight because I'm worried that we may lose sight of the forest for the trees. As I understand it, the research has been done, and it is clear later start times for high school students may not be a magic bullet solving every possible problem. But later start times and the extra sleep that they make possible do, in fact, improve student health, student academic performance, and student athletic performance. I see no reason to think that our kids will be different than other high school students on this point. Overall, they will do better if we make the start time later. As far as I'm concerned, that research means that we should not talk about whether to move to a later start time. The question is how we can move to a later start time with a minimum of cost and disruption. Although the plans under consideration are surely not perfect, they both strike me as reasonable ways to move forward. I share some of the particular concerns that others have expressed, including friends of mine. 
I certainly do not want to undermine the athletic programs at Northampton, in which my son participates, nor do I want to compromise the ability of students to meet with their teachers, which my son does. But to suggest that we should not move forward on these grounds or other similar grounds strikes me as a mistake. Other schools have managed to move to a later start time without creating major problems for their sport teams or for the students who need academic help. Surely we can too. But this is a question of details, and as important as these details are, they should not distract us from the key point. A later start time has real and measurable benefits for our kids. I very much hope that we will not get bogged down in the details and will instead go ahead with a later start time so that our kids can experience the health, educational, and athletic benefits of extra school. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The next speaker is Michael Di Pasquale. Hi, Michael Di Pasquale, 55 Woodlawn. And uh, I have a son in ninth grade at Northampton High School, and I support the later start time. I was at last night's meeting, I've been in a lot of meetings. Um, and I was disappointed last night that we couldn't make more progress, but I understand that there was lots of different opinions and I left there actually somewhat confused, to be, to be very honest. Um, obviously, the change in start time and the way we're thinking about buses are going to have a ripple effect on the junior high school and the um, grade schools. But in my opinion, this should be worked out by the administration. It's complicated, maybe, but I don't think it's impossible. And I think it would be a shame, having come so far, and really being on the brink of making a decision to punt tonight. And we shouldn't lose the momentum we have, and we can't lose sight, really, of why many of us are here tonight and why we've been working on this for many years. And two important reasons, of course, we've, people have said these tonight already, but I'll repeat them. One, the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly clear that high school students benefit from more sleep. A later start time allows for this. And school districts all across the country, including some right here in Western Massachusetts, have made this change already. And somehow they've managed to accommodate their sports, their extracurriculars, and a lot of other things that people have been talking about. I think we can do it here in Northampton. Secondly, and very importantly, academic performance, which is why we're sending our kids to school in the first place, and physical and mental well-being of teenagers benefits from later start times. Now last night, if you take coordinating the bus schedules out of this discussion for a second, we heard the high school principal and virtually all the school administrators that were there saying that they were in favor of a later start time. Finally, the current Northampton High School start time of 7.30 is not sacrosanct. It has not always been at 7.30. It's been later in the past. And when it was changed to the current time, we got used to it. Or whoever was going there, I wasn't here, they got used to it. People adapted then. If we make a change now, we will get used to it. Thank you. The next speaker is David McGrath. I'm David McGraw. I live at 55 Woodlawn Avenue, and I have a ninth grader in the system and an eighth grader. And I'm here to speak in favor of the later start time. I, I'm also a physician in town, and I have read all the studies and gone to meetings about sleep, sleep deprivation in adolescents, and I just think that the evidence is really there, and it's strong, and it's a great opportunity to make our school even better. I think you know, that's what we're all doing this for, and I think we should do it. And I, I'm sure the details will work out, I think. Thank you. The next speaker is Casey Fowler. Hi, Casey Fowler, 91 West Hampton Road. I'm here tonight um, in a couple of different capacities. I'm here as a parent. I have two boys in Northampton schools. and. If this does not go through, I'm pretty much at your mercy and we'll get my children to school when they are supposed to be there. Um, I'm here as, as an alumni, one of the last graduating classes who went to school at the same time, elementary, middle school, 
and high school. We did fine. We must have had more money then. We had a lot of buses. And I remember thinking when they changed the start time, thank God I'm out of school because that is ridiculously early to get up. And I'm also here as a citizen because the future of our country depends on these kids. Um, so with so many things that are going on nowadays, we need to give them the best chance positive, possible. And lastly, I'm here as a professional. I'm a nurse practitioner who has worked exclusively with sleep disorders for the past five and a half years. I have seen what happens to people when they're overtired. I have had people come to my office because they've lost their license, because they fell asleep while driving, who've lost their jobs because of performance, who've lost their jobs and doing poorly in school because they can't get to where they need to be because they are exhausted, or they can't do what they need to do because they're exhausted. I also had the opportunity to be on the uh, board, or on the committee that the previous superintendent made four years ago. That's what kind of pulled me into this, and I thought it was really interesting, and I thought it was a great idea to change it. I still do. I was on the research part of the committee. All we found was positive things. There was not one negative study of starting school times later. What we found is if you're chronically sleep deprived, you have an increase in motor vehicle crashes, an increase in depression, a decrease in mental clarity, the ability to problem solve, and a decrease in productivity. So it's for these reasons I think it's really important to make this happen. I'm also a little bit distressed that we're now on our second mayor and our second uh, superintendent and still haven't come up with a plan. When the school start times was changed, and anyone who was here back then can disagree or um, correct me, but I think it was all financial. It was because of busing. Now I think we need to make the choice because of what's right and not throw a ton of money about, at it. Try to use and think outside of the box to find ways to make it happen. And I agree with one of the previous speakers who said it was hard. Everyone adjusted, and if it, we have to change it again, it'll be hard, but everyone will adjust. And at least we're doing it for the right reason, which is to improve our children's ability to do their jobs versus just thinking about it financially. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian Smith. Brian Smith, 35 New South Street. I'm a uh, physician. I'm a board-certified neurologist and board-certified sleep uh, in sleep medicine and uh, co-owner of uh, Sleep Medicine Services of Western Massachusetts. We have sleep centers in Amherst and also Springfield. We manage several uh, sleep centers. So I, I think you've heard the data is very clear that this is a, really a truly a biologic process that the, the, these children really require about nine to quarter hours of sleep and they're not obtaining that. So basically with the current sleep, with the current school schedules, we place them in direct conflict with their biologic needs. And as a result, uh, all the things that have been mentioned, all the consequences of sleep deprivation occur, you know, as, as uh, several speakers have mentioned. The interesting thing is the most common complaint we see in our office every day is excessive daytime sleepiness. So, so we see adults come in, and I see grown men in tears basically talking to me about, I've seen police officers, because they're so tired throughout the day. And we know that these students are sleep deprived, and they have the same type of experiences, but we're doing nothing to kind of do, to change that for them. We're telling them that they should continue throughout their school day, that they can get caught up on weekends, but they are truly, really sleep deprived, and they're experiencing all the symptoms that have been described, but it's not in their purview to complain about it. And as a result, it's even more, it places even more responsibility on us to really act on it and to do something to, to uh, change their sleep schedules and allow them to have more sleep time so that they're not sleep deprived and we don't see these types of consequences in their behavior. Thank you. The next uh, speaker is Aaron Voss. my friends participate in sports and I and almost everyone I know wants the start time to stay the same if it changes we will just have the same to stay up later and get the, our home to get our homework done I enjoy being done at two and being able to participate in activities after that kids are not going to bed 
to get more sleep unless you add another hour to the day to make it 25 hours. <laughs> well, that's an option. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Kathy Hanauer. I'm just being very sorry. Okay. We appreciate that. Uh, uh, Sarah. Um, I'd like to add my thanks. You can just say your name and address. Oh, sorry. Sarah Buttonweiser, 46 Franklin Street. I'd like to add my thanks to you for taking this issue on for as long as it takes. Um, and I. Um, the, the, the research is really clear in, in my little piece of digging. I reached out to some of the other schools in the area that started later, and I just wanted to read really a quick sentence from Jen Fulcher, who is the head of the middle school at Williston, who says, I am a big fan of Late Start over here, and I think it has made a big difference, and believe it would for every kid in every high school. Um, personally, I have one kid who has an easy time getting up and one who has a hard time getting up and it really is the compelling research that says later would make our children healthier and for their long-term adult health it makes me hope we can figure out a way to do this that will not be detrimental to the whole system but will be making a decision based on the value of health thank you thank you, thank you. The next speaker is Nat Jones. Nat. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Jones. I live at 82 Harrison Ave. I'm 14 years old and I'm currently in my freshman year at NHS. I would greatly appreciate a later start time as I'm a kid that has a lot of trouble waking up and getting to school on time. I've gotten good grades all throughout middle school, and I'm doing well in my second, third, and fourth period classes. But in my first period class, French 1, I have my lowest grade. This is not because it's my hardest class, but because I simply can't learn anything that early in the morning. I am sure that many people would benefit from a later start time, especially my friends and the other kids that drink coffee in the morning just to stay awake. I'm five foot one, 85 pounds, and I'm not gonna grow unless I get some sleep. Please change the start time. I know that everyone would come to appreciate it. Thank you. The next speaker is Renee Wetstein. I would never go time past <laughs> Renee Wetstein, 222 Elm Street. I urge the school committee tonight to select option three with the understanding that the superintendent will fine tune the start times to have the least amount of impact on JFK start time dovetailed with the optimal transportation system. We are mixing up start times with bus times. Presently, Northampton High School official start time is 7.30 a.m. However, the buses drop off as early as 7.05 a.m. If you choose option three, you can still officially have JFK remain the current start time of 7.55 a.m., but their buses drop off earlier and have the students take the buses, have breakfast at school, study in the library, or work out in the gym, as they have in the past for the early morning program. Option three can be worked out where there is absolutely no impact on the elementary present start and end times if you have busing pickup at Northampton High School after the elementary pickup. According to our current bus company provider, this would not add any cost to the busing. This can absolutely work out, and there are many factors, such as the transportation contract, that will impact the exact bus times and bus routes. Last night at the forum, a parent who is not in favor of a later start time for the high school quoted our outstanding biology MCAS results and said if students were sleeping in classes, how can we have such great results? Actually, we don't have outstanding results. 30% of low-income students Yes, 30% of low-income students um, 30 have either needs improvement or failed the MCAS in the biology. 18% of all students need improvement or failed, and 40% of students with disabilities failed. Last night, a student admitted falling to sleep in fourth period as an argument that the early start time is not the cause of him falling, um, failing, uh, falling asleep. 
The latest start time is a big part of falling asleep in fourth period classes because many students drink coffee, like Nat Jones just said, in the morning and use all their resources to stay awake in the early part of the day and can no longer fight their exhaustion by fourth period. When a survey was conducted in Northampton High School in 2010, only eight parents said they rely on older children to care for their youngest siblings. Northampton Public School District Imp Improvement Plan for 2012-2013 mission statement states, the mission of the Northampton Public Schools in partnership with parents, guardians, and the Northampton community is to promote and support high achievement by each student in a safe, healthy, secure environment and to enable each student to become a critical thinker and a socially responsible citizen in a global society. Nowhere in the statement does it state our goal is to align our schedule to fit into the Smith Indoor Track optimal times to practice. These logistical issues will be worked out to the best of every student. We know that a later start time will align with our mission to provide a healthy environment for our students. It is critical for our students to give them an extra 45 minutes to an hour of sleep in the morning. Please vote for option three with the understanding that the details will be worked out with the least amount of impact on JFK and no impact on the elementary schools if you cannot get a contract and the community buy-in to extend the day by 20 minutes. With the five-year bus contract expiring next year, this is the time to make it happen. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Zach Dietz. That's her son. <laughs> Zachary Dietz, 222 Elm Street. Uh, I am a proponent. Pro I am a proponent of a later school start time, as you all know by now, for many reasons. The most important of these reasons is that I myself am a sleep deprived student and I experience firsthand the harm sleep depri deprivation can do to my cognitive and emotional state. I have heard many people say that there is no connection between school start time and sleep. However, it has been proved by a multitude of studies that students get more sl sleep with later start times. More specifically, each minute the, s the school start time is pushed back students get roughly the same bonus in sleep. I hope you all already know this because last week I told you, I last week I took the liberty of emailing this information to you and Dr. Schwab has just earlier restated it. I have heard some committee members say that plan three is not one that will benefit all students because of the JFK start time change. I've just never been able to understand this point of view. Plan three allows high schoolers to gain 45 minutes of sleep a night while taking away 15 minutes a night from middle schoolers. I have always kept in mind that Northampton students spend three years at JFK and four years at NHS. This means that a Northampton student will gain over 400 hours of sleep that they are missing out on now. This sleep help, helps out with students' grades, athletic performance, attention, mental state, anxiety levels, attendance record, growth, and even decreases the chances of cancer and tumors. So it has always been clear to me that Plan 3 is an amazing option that definitely deserves a yes, and I hope you feel the same way too. I wish, to I wish to address an issue that has been brought up by many people who wish to keep the start time the same. This claim is that though the research shows that later school start time benefits the students, our schools might not see this same benefit because Northampton is unique and we don't really have attendance problems or get grade problems. To this I ask the question, is there something special in the air here? Do we have something special about our water source? What is so special about Northampton that makes our teenagers' biological clocks irrelevant? Do we not live under the same sun as all other school systems that have made this change and see the, be seen the benefits? Maybe Mr. Harrell back there is putting something special in his ice cream that makes our students <laughs> immune to sleep deprivation. Of course, all these notions are insane. I find it to be somewhat of an absurdity to suggest that Northampton is some anomaly where modern science doesn't apply. Lastly, I wish to address another issue that uh, people in favor of keeping the start time the same have brought up. The issue is that a lot of students don't want this change. I want to note that there is a lot of students who do want this change, but more importantly, this change shouldn't really be up to the students. It should be up to you guys because you guys know what's best. If your child asked you to eat candy for breakfast in the morning, you would say, no, that's absurd. This is sort of that scenario. You need to do what's best for the students. Speaking of, Steve Harrell is the next speaker. <laughs> I 
I could <coughs> find that magic substance. But <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, uh, my name is Steve Harrell. I live at 474 Elm Street, and my daughter graduated from Northampton High School in 2006. First of all, City Councilor Jesse Adams regrets he was not able to come tonight, but Councilor Adams wanted me to pass along to you that he very much favors a later start time. One of you on the committee here suggested that what the school committee still wants to hear most is facts and figures about early start times. No problem. Here we go. One thing we hear over and over, I can skip some of these because they've already been mentioned. Uh, we hear over and over that if the start time is later, students will just stay up later the night before and won't get more sleep. This is just not true. There is so much evidence to the contrary, it's overwhelming. I'll just say that in the exhaustive study of the Minneapolis public school system, some of their 12 high schools were moved from 7.30 to 8.30. Four years later into that study, students at the later starting schools were average, averaging 60 minutes more sleep on weeknights than their peers at the earlier starting schools. Robert Verona, a sleep doctor at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia, with the help of the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles, studied two nearby districts, Virginia Beach, where the school's high school starts at 720, and nearby Chesapeake, where the school starts at 840. In the earlier starting school, there were 64.5 accidents per 1,000 drivers, teen drivers. In the later starting school, there were 46.2 uh, accidents per 1,000 teen drivers. That's a 40% higher crash rate in the district where schools start earlier. Uh, I, so, one thing we've also heard is that most Northampton High School students uh, do not favor a start. However, in 2009, in a survey done under the auspices of the school, uh, with 700 students responding, 65% uh, of the students did say that they preferred a later start time. These facts and figures are just coming along here. Uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, researchers reported that teens, this is about sleep, sports injuries. Teens who sleep at least eight hours each night have 68% lower risk of sports injuries compared to those who regularly sleep less. Uh, I guess I'll just skip finally to say that uh, in that exhaustive, exhaustive study at um, the University of Minnesota, uh, that conclusion, one of the conclusions was, quote, prior to the delay of start times, parents predicted adjusting start times would interfere with after school sports and transportation. Afterwards, however, 92% of the parents decided they favored the new schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeff Finley. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Finley. I live at 39 Clare Avenue. Uh, I'm not in favor of the late start. We always hear how great the Northampton schools are. Are we doing poorly on MCAS? Are we doing poorly on SATs? Are our kids not getting into college? The answer to all that is no. Is there a truancy issue? No. So are we talking about starting a later day so we can take a, a student from a 93 to a 95? There are four forms over the summer plus the one last night. The principals don't want the later start time. The majority of the teachers don't want it. And even if we look at this room, half the room does and half the room doesn't. And, and the, uh, the, the latest survey they did uh, over the summer said the majority of the students didn't want it. What are we really teaching our kids? We just had an election. If you didn't vote for President Obama, can we keep complaining until we have another form so we can re-vote again about it? I ask that the, the school committee Make the choice tonight, which I see is on the agenda, thank goodness, and, and, and vote what you need to vote. Um, my, my other half of this is uh, the school committee needs to think about every student, not just the high school students. As a parent of a student who is also in the elementary school, a later, a later uh, having the elementary day drag on longer is not good for my elementary student or any elementary student. Currently right now, she gets picked up at the bus stop at 8.20. If the proposed change is to move that day another 20 minutes, 
That means she's not getting home till four o'clock in the afternoon next year. That's a long time to be at school. School is a struggle for her. Her, what gives her self-esteem is being able to go to dance, going to play basketball, doing all these after-school activities that, that, as it stands right now, have to be cut because she can't get home till 3.30. Now we're gonna extend the day and kick her out till four. I asked the school committee when they look at that piece of it, not extend the elementary day. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Andy Zimblas. My name is Andy Zimblas, 65 Ward Avenue. I have two children in the high school. I teach at Smith College, and I want to begin by saying that uh, I have thought long and hard about the assertion that Mark Horowitz made to you a few minutes ago uh, that a changed or later start time would hurt the ability of students to take classes at Smith. Uh, I don't have a colleague who believes that to be true. The only person I know that gets cited sometimes in reference to that claim is Sam and Trader. Sam doesn't believe it. Sam's comment is that some uh, there are some hours of the day when the classes would be more difficult to take and there are other classes that would be easier to take. My colleague, Dr. Mary Harrington, is out of town and asked me to read a statement tonight. Dr. Harrington is a chaired professor of life sciences at Smith. She is recognized as one of the leading experts in the country on circadian rhythms. She has received 10 grants from the NIH and NSF, two grants from the Mellon Foundation, one from Pfizer, totaling well over $2 million. She has published 62 scholarly articles in scientific journals. For, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to read just a portion of what she said, and I'll pass around copies if you'd like to see more. <coughs> this is Mary Hamilton's <coughs> words. I am in favor of starting Northampton uh, High School at a later time. I have conducted research for 30 years in the field of circadian rhythms and sleep. People are governed by an inner biological clock. Teenagers differ from adults in their need for longer daily amounts of sleep. Not getting enough sleep can lead to metabolic changes. If young, healthy men cut back on their sleep by one and a half hours per night for three weeks, scientists find changes in insulin sensitivity and body weight. Thus, we can change a healthy young adult to an adult with signs of prediabetes by shortening their sleep. Prediabetes can lead to type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Why are Dr. Dr. Harrington's words important? Last night and over the last several months, I keep hearing that there is no direct connection between sleep deprivation and student performance and health. I have also heard, and my kids have heard, from other students at the high school that the literature is inconclusive. These claims are patently false. The reality is that there is a demonstrated strong connection and that the impacts are multifaceted not only on student learning but on student health, on athletic injuries, and on car accidents. Thus, there are large and undeniable benefits from, that benefits from a later start time. So on one side of the equation, there are large and significant benefits. What about the costs? Uh, I see I don't have much time, so I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff, which, which is, talks about my own background in sports. I'm very concerned about sports. I work in the sports industry in addition to teaching. In my view, what needs to happen, whether you vote for a later start time tonight or to delay your vote, is for there to be a committee to explore the impacts of a later start time and to explore ways to mitigate these impacts. The committee should consist of administrators like Jim Miller and Joy Winnie, teachers and parents. It should look at everything, including the possibility of reducing the time of blocks from an hour and 35 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes. This alone would add 20 minutes to practice time for sports and would probably be a pedagogical plus. According to Nancy Athis, such a change would be compatible. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it would be compatible. Sorry. Finish the sentence. The next speaker is Adam Hall. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Adam Hall. I'm at 107 Whittier Street in Florence. Uh, I'm a director of the neuroscience program at Smith College, and, and so I come to you really just to talk about the neurobiology of this. Um, and uh, some of my interest in that, really to sort of share some of the ideas that, um, that Dr. Schwab uh, put forward, uh, but also others on the biological basis of, um, of uh, sleep de deprivation. But um, one thing that sort of struck me about this, I mean, was is that um, in terms of the brain, is, is that we have some very important centers in the base of our brain. Um, it has a fancy name for it, the reticular activating system, but essentially you could actually sort of see this as your attention sort of centers, and it's actually those output to pretty much throughout the brain. Um, but what I wanted to sort of focus on mainly was the outputs to the memory centers, and so uh, these memory centers are effectively primed by this attention, um, these, these attention centers. And so the idea here is, is that those are fully active during wakefulness. 
and they prime those memory centers for um, memory consolidation, effectively uh, learning new information, learning new skills. And so uh, my argument would be that if we're sending children and we're sending our kids off in this rather sort of sleepy and sort of uh, and uh, almost sedated state, I'd even make it equivalent to sort of say sending our kids off to school, um, giving them a dose of Valium just before they actually head out the door, the, 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 given how um, sleepy they are and actually how um, disconnected they are at that time, um, and it, particularly at that point of their circadian cycle. Effectively, these centers are not fully active. These attention centers in the base of our brains are not fully active. So they're not priming the memory centers. So they are, our kids, at least in those first couple of classes, are not really in a position to acquire new information. They're not in a position to learn, um, to, to consolidate new memories and to learn new skills. Um, so on a sort of more general note, I would sort of say that um, Yes, you know, I think obviously this s s later school start times would make some inroads in basically improving sort of academic achievement, um, improving uh, our uh, academic development for our kids. And so I think given the pressures that they're under and given the pressures that this generation is under in terms of the sort of global concerns of actually competing in global enterprise, that we really need to emphasize and put much more emphasis on academic achievement. And so I think it's well overdue that we actually send our kids to school in um, a frame of mind and actually with their attention centers primed so that they can actually then acquire the knowledge and use this knowledge uh, in a productive way. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah Kaish Pollen at 40 School Street. Um, I am a brand new parent in the system. My daughter started kindergarten uh, this year at Bridge Street. I um, also joined the PTO and now I'm on the school council at Bridge Street as well. Um, and I realize this conversation has been going on for a long time, certainly past my start in the system. Um, and I hate to be the person to like throw the wrench in and say we can't move forward because I know a lot of people are impatient to move forward. If we could move forward with this being distangled <coughs> from the 20 minute extension to the elementary school day, I would be in favor actually of a, of a um, later start time. It seems like all of the research points to that. My issue is with process and with the elementary community not being engaged in a conversation or even being an, aware that the 20 minute extension is now attached to this vote and this decision. I actually think that's a really big deal. Um, it's potentially very contentious um, with the union. And if you're talking about money, then you're talking about paying teachers an extra 20 minutes every day. That's going to cost the district a lot more money because teachers have to be paid for their time. Um, all of the public forums that have happened have been labeled um, the late start forum. Nowhere in the title did it say extended day. People did not know in the elementary school community. I don't think it is ethical to now group these two together and then say, oh, now everyone has to deal with the extra 20 minutes that's happening in the extended school day. If, as someone mentioned earlier, that there can be a solution, like the, if the number three can happen, and the elementary school day stays the same, I am absolutely for it. But if you can't vote on that, then I think you cannot vote on this issue. Because I, and I actually think that, um, it's, there is a possible even violation of an open meeting law here because people were not aware. This extended day issue was not publicly made, pu made public that this was attached to this decision. So that's Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Johanna McKenna. <clears throat> I am Joanna McKenna. I think my address is to 12 Main Street. It feels like it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm the interim director of academic effectiveness, and prior to that, I was the principal at the Bridge Street School. And um, I guess I just really wanted to say a few things. One of the things is that um, I really uh, admire the passion that people are bringing to this topic. Um, I really love to see communities engaged in issues like this that affect the schools. And I believe, well, I'm going to speak for myself, although I think I believe that some of 
what feels to be ambivalence on the part of administrators comes from the fact that no one really denies the accuracy of the, de of the research. And everyone wants to do what is in the best interest of high school students um, overall. I think as an administrator, however, um, I think in terms of the cost benefits and I think in terms of the, the hidden costs and the unintended consequences, and that's what gives me pause. And I wanted to just talk briefly about um, our process at Bridge Street when we were, we were looking at expanding the school day. We took several um, years to look at that. And at that time, we had decided that um, in order to make such a huge shift for families, um, that it was important that we did it when we had a certain amount of buy-in from the families involved. And after several years of, of discussion, it turned out that, that we did not have sufficient buy-in to make it an effective uh, intervention, and we did not do it. Does that mean that there wasn't research that extending a school day could improve achievement? No, extending a school day can improve achievement, but it was not the right time. And because there wasn't people's uh, awareness of the issue, it hadn't been convincing. We had not been convincing enough in presenting um, that as an option to families. I think that, um, so while, it, while the decision might be the right decision, it might not, the timing might still be wrong. And I think listening to parents at the elementary level talk about wanting to be a part of the decision making, I think speaks to that. And I, the other thing is that it really boils down to money. I hate to really say that, but the only reason why the elementary, ending the elementary later is even part of the discussion is because it was a way to do this in, that was cost neutral or relatively cost neutral, even though it's not clear that it can be when you work out the details. And I don't think the details are that easily, you know, brushed off to a committee and say, oh, go work out the details. I mean, I think my concern is, again, that I think Northampton would do this at the drop of a hat if we had the money. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Susan Voss. Hi, my name is Susan Voss and I live at 89 Ridgewood Terrace. I think I might be the only Smith professor here who's speaking on the other side. Um, I agree that a lack of sleep is a problem. Sleep de deprivation is certainly not healthy for any of our kids. However, um, I'm going to go outside the box here and say that I don't actually find the research all that compelling. I've, a couple years ago, I signed a petition that said, please start school later. I thought it sounded like a good idea. And since then, I've been keeping my ears open and reading things. And over the last few weeks, I've tried to look into some of this literature. Um, there's a lot of studies, yes, that talk about circadian rhythms. Do they say that they, how many hours should we delay the school start time? I'm not convinced that one hour later actually takes care of all of the hidden costs associated with that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But before I go into that, I want to say the research that I found and what I think is being cited is largely being cited by the popular media. And if you go back to some of where it's coming from, I'm glad Steve mentioned the <coughs> Minneapolis study. From what I've seen of that study, it's not a controlled study. It's not a peer-reviewed study. I found another study that said for every hour you start school later, kids get 20 minutes extra of sleep. You can find a lot of things out there. And in the scientific community, a lot of this would not hold up. So I think if you're really serious about listening to some of this research, it, it would be worth having an unbiased scientist give you um, more information on it. I'm not an expert. I haven't found it all. But I think there's some real concerns. And my final anecdote along those lines is about three years ago, faculty in the psychology department at Smith thought this was a really interesting problem for their students. They thought they'd be engaged in looking into this problem. So they tested their seniors' uh, critical thinking skills by giving them some excerpts from some of these papers we're hearing about and asked them to come up with, does it matter if we start school late? And what was found was there's a lot of trends but not statistical answers in this. And the psychology faculty that I've spoken to in the last two weeks unilaterally said they don't see a lot of benefit. There, there's trends, there's little benefits, but it's not 
all that convincing. That was three years ago. Maybe there's more recent studies. I don't know. Finally, I just want to say I think the costs of this are really high, and we've heard about those. This gentleman here told you about the cost and the aquatic center, which I'm familiar with because my daughter plans to be on the swim team. I'm not sure we're going to have a swim team at this school if you make these changes because of the way the rec department works. We've, there are many sports teams. The varsity high school, uh, the football team, the varsity teams might not be affected. But talking to Jim Miller, there are numerous JV teams that are going to be affected. And all of these health benefits we're hearing about sleep also apply to athletics. And I think we need to keep that in mind that in addition to that, a lot of these kids get great benefit from participating in athletics. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Hannah. And I apologize, I can not read the end of your last name. So you'll. My name is Hannah Bellinger. I live on Belmont Avenue, and I'm a student at Northampton High School. I would like to speak in favor of a later start time. I think that the 8:15 start would be beneficial for Northampton High School community. And I wonder, if you can't change the start time, could you please ask my teachers to give me less than four and a half hours of homework each night? Thank you. <laughs> The next uh, speaker, uh, the final pe speaker signed up is Joseph Smith, Principal Joseph Smith. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Joseph Smith, and I'm the proud principal of Leeds Elementary School out of the 54 Ward Avenue. And real quick, because a lot of good things have been said already, I just have three things to say. Number one, I represent the family and students of Leeds, and those families and students I've spoken to have clearly expressed their desire to not change the late start time. The second thing I want to say is that it's unfair totally to build around the high school and totally not take into account how families are feeling at the uh, grade level. Thirdly, while there's a lot of research out there, and I notice that people are picking and choosing the research to suit themselves, the research I want to walk away with is the one that says it, the, the difference takes two hours of late time start to make a difference in terms of student performance. You cannot just simply say by starting the school day an hour later that students will perform better. There are a lot of factors that are involved in student performance. Thank you very much. I hope that the decision that is made is one that is clearly on the best interest of the entire district because we have enough divisiveness in our district. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That completes the sign up list. Is there anyone else who didn't sign up who wishes to speak? <laughs> okay, I'm happy. I'm sorry, I'm just, these are the things that I said I was going to pass around. From Thank you. Harrison. So if you could just state your name and address. My name is Jason McGrath, uh, 55 Woodlawn Ave, and I just want to say that I'm in favor for the later start time. <coughs> uh, I heard someone say earlier, well, for one, that improving grade from like 93 to 95 isn't that much, but I personally think I'd rather have that A than that A minus. <laughs> and also, <laughs> people, uh, I, I love sports, I do cross country. And people are saying that like uh, it's gonna affect cross like sports after, and all. Uh, but um, uh, but I think that uh, it that <laughs> if it's not changed that much to like 8:15 to 2:30, you can still have sports at three and get some like time in with teachers with af after. And also, like uh, a bunch of my other friends, I, I personally cannot concentrate first period. Uh, I've definitely fallen asleep in class a couple of times because I was tired. So I would like to start time to change. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? 
Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll uh, close the public comment period. I did want to say before I begin the announcement period, uh, and this is for the folks here at, uh, in the audience as well, um, we did receive, uh, I received, and I believe colleagues on the school committee received an email this afternoon um, regarding the concerns about the open meeting law and the posting of the meeting. Um, and I take those concerns very seriously. I've spoken myself to the Attorney General. I've also uh, consulted with the city solicitor. And I am sufficiently concerned enough about it and about the potential for a violation in terms of how, the, um, how this was listed on the agenda that I am going to recommend, uh, we're going to defer this issue until the next meeting to allow us to properly post it 48 hours in advance. Um, this is a ruling that I'm making as the chair. Um, if there's any questions about it from my colleagues, again, there's a concern about the way that it's posted. I do not believe there was an intent um, on the part of this committee uh, uh, to not provide full information on the agenda, uh, but because, um, as correctly pointed out, the, the proposal would do more than just change the start time, but would have an impact on the length of the school day. Um, I believe that is a, a valid concern that that has not been part of this posting of the public meeting. Um, and the, the open meeting law has changed in Massachusetts. Um, and in reviewing recent rulings by the Attorney General in this regard, uh, this, is, this is an area of concern for me. So I believe it's safer for the school committee to defer this to the next meeting. We'll make sure that the posting of this on the next agenda is uh, much more uh, defining and clearer. And so that's, I just want to let people know that if you're waiting around to stay for that issue. Is there any way to make, to, to separate the two issues now and do the start time tonight and do the elementary I don't, well, given the fact that the, well, given the fact that the proposals before us, it's embedded in the proposals before us. I think that's the crux of the issue. I, I, re I really can't interact with the audience. I'm sorry. We're not really allowed to do that. Um, so, uh, if any of my colleagues have any questions about that, um, I'm happy to entertain them. But I just wanted to let the, the folks who've come here tonight know that that's going to be the position that I'm going to take as the chair. Do you want to discuss that now, or do you want to discuss that when we get to the issue? Of I think if you'd like to discuss it now, I, you can ask a question. I don't have specific concerns about what you've just said, but it sounds like leading into a discussion about the issue. So I'm just we're not leading into a discussion of okay. the issue. I just wanted to let people know early so that when I make that ruling later in the meeting, uh, that they won't be disappointed or felt like they've wasted their time. Okay, are there any other um, announcements? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the recommended actions. Uh, and we have consent, a consent agenda vote this evening. Um, I believe that the uh, approval of the minutes of October 11th is being removed from the consent agenda because those were not prepared. Um, there is a contract, one contract, which is uh, the vendor is the Northeast Foundation for Children. It's in the amount of $6,950. It's for professional development uh, lead staff for re responsive classroom training. Also on the consent agenda are uh, set of field trip requests. The first is for JFK, uh, New York, New York, a Netherland Theater, April 24th, 2013. The second is uh, JFK, New York, New York, a Spanish Theater Repertory Company, April 29th, 2013. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any uh, comments about the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Uh, we'll now move to reports and recommendations, and we'll begin with our a report from our student representative, Alex Rifkin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, last time we were here, we had talked about a lot of things very quickly. We weren't really on the, uh, the agenda, so it was kind of introduction for us to speak to you. Uh, Sarah was an, unable to make it tonight, so it's just going to be me. Um, 
First and foremost, the next month and a half is going to be very hectic for us at Northampton High School. There's a lot of things going on. Starting with tomorrow is the end of quarter one for grades. So a lot of teachers and students have been rushing to get these last minute grades in. Um, and then up until about Christmas break, there are a lot of assemblies and different extracurricular activities going on that have been changing um, and really building for the last month or so and getting ready to the transition, not just with grades, but with sports. Because um, besides a couple teams, including tonight's uh, girls varsity team that had a game tonight, a lot of teams are finishing up for the fall season and transitioning into the winter season with registration with the deadline being November 19th. A lot of new athletes are coming in, a lot of new underclassmen, and we've seen actually a rise in students participating in these sports over the last few years, especially with a lot more of these underclassmen joining these sports teams and getting involved um, with extracurriculars. Um, besides the sports, we do have a lot of theater uh, students participating in the Annie uh, play, which will be going on the musical. Uh, the rehearsals are going on, or excuse me, the um, auditions are going on now. Rehearsals will be taking place after Thanksgiving break. Um, and we had spoken, uh, specifically Sarah had spoken about the Black Box Theater that had been destroyed, unfortunately, by water damage uh, early on in the year. And that, luckily, has been rebuilt. It will be opening up for an open house on November 29th. A lot of parents and students chipped in to raise money to help build for that. And so it's a good program and a good uh, fundraiser effort that went through to uh, make this rebuilding effort go through. Another thing I want to talk about is on November 19th, we have a scholarship for the Daniel Goldman, uh, a Goldstein Assembly, which is in memory of David uh, Daniel Goldstein. And what it is is we usually have a musical performance uh, by some either local or international or uh, just famous uh, musical talent come in perform for us. Uh, this year we have uh, Neville Charles, who is a jazz performer. And so we have organized two different periods throughout the day for him to perform. Uh, to give us a little uh, jazz music throughout the day where our lunch is going to be jambalaya and kind of this cultural theme day uh, based around that and this new, e uh, new Orleans theme. So that's really good. But the thing I'm really here to talk about tonight is something that just went into effect yesterday and that was actually just talked about yesterday and a lot of people, especially a lot of the administration at the school don't know about and that is um, because of the election being over, a lot of the focus now is turning back to Hurricane Sandy and a lot of people here wanted to donate or to give some relief towards those victims. And so next Friday is our blood drive at the high school, which is something that is very important to the high school. A lot of uh, students donate blood, and so that's a really good effort. But we wanted to take it a step further. So what uh, Kim Broussard and some of the administrators talked about yesterday was doing a drive for food, for batteries, for uh, clothing, for any blankets that could be donated um, from the community of Northampton or from the Northampton High School parents or teachers, uh, students, to be able to donate to victims uh, down in New, the Manhattan area and the uh, New Jersey area. Because a lot of us, um, we see on the news, we aren't able to help personally. We don't think we can. And so this is a good way to help um, those victims. What we've thought about doing is also next Friday is our advisory group. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if you do, that's um, good. Because it is something that did, have, that did start last year and is where we have the different students with teachers paired off different grade levels to get this connection with uh, other students and teachers in the school. What we decided to do is different advisory groups will be making posters, pamphlets, calling local radio shows, the mayor's office, and different offices um, in Northampton to ask for donations, to ask if we can put up flyers in the local businesses and see if they want to donate to get the word out about this cause because we don't want it to just be Northampton High School thing. We want the community to be involved because we are Northampton High School. We do want um, the community to be involved to help uh, donate and all. Um, and give these supplies that maybe just not the parents have, but also other community members. We do want this to be um, something in Western Mass where other schools, uh, such as Hampshire, East Hampton, even uh, Smith Vogue, other schools can help come in, donate supplies that they um, can personally send, that they can, we have a collection. Hopefully, the week of Thanksgiving, um, we will be doing this so we can get it out as soon as possible, especially with the nor'easter that hit. Um, there's a lot of materials and uh, supplies that aren't getting there fast enough. So it's a good progress and uh, procedure for our school to be doing. Uh, I think I just heard about this yesterday, so I thought it was a very um, well-rounded idea that the administrators came up with, with just in a day with a meeting. So hopefully uh, they will be asking for some donations and all that. And the last thing, which is more based around the actual schools themselves, is 
Um, we want to talk to local schools in the New Jersey area and the Manhattan area that still don't have power, that might not have school back up yet, that have lost books, um, all the materials that teachers have lost, all their materials that they may have bought themselves to help donate to those schools specifically, to ask for anything they need specifically, any books they may have lost, any um, if they need supplies that they bought themselves, if we can help donate to those specific schools. So we know we're not just donating a blanket to someone, we know we're donating books to a specific school, to a specific teacher who needs the stuff that have lost things they worked hard for for their students to work hard for so they don't lose behind uh, specific time and resources that we here have and are lucky to have. So it's just something that I think will be a great effort and hopefully the Northampton community can come together and donate to that because I think um, at North and High, Northampton High School we donated five barrels of food to the local food bank um, from Booster Week. So I think we can, if not match that, make greater uh, funds and donations from a community and get the community involved again in Northampton High School um, because it is something that uh, we want the community involved in our high school and we want the community to be active not just in the local level but in the uh, statewide and in the uh, national level so hopefully that will take charge and uh, the community will come together for that. Thank you very much for that Thank report. You. Yes, I'd like to. First of all, I just wanted to tell you how well reported that was. Thank you. Do you have any idea where you're collecting all of this stuff and how it's going to get to New York and New Jersey? What the procedure, again, it's very early on. They're going to be hopefully talking about this within the next week. What they want to do is have a collection center at the high school to be taking part from uh, Monday, and I don't know the exact date. It'll be uh, not next Monday, but the week uh, after until that Friday. Um, again, with that, I was questioning how they're with uh, – school being out for the Thursday and Friday if they were still going to have a collection there. Um, the way they made it sound, they would either have a collection center there and then move it or just keep it there and have the school open for people to donate food or clothing or blankets. And what they want to do was newer, obviously, not old blankets or any of that, but newer stuff. Um, but again, it's early on, so I don't know the specific details in terms of that, but I just know what they want to do is have a collection center at Northampton High School and to get the word out so people knew it was going to be there at the school. No, no sense yet of how things are going to actually move down south. Yeah. Um, what they wanted to do, again, was just to kind of collect it at one and then ship it down. Um, logistically, I don't know how they're going <coughs> to it. Again, it's kind of hit them very fast, and I know that's... I'm totally off that topic. I just wanted to remind you that um, there are two of you, but only one of you sits at the table and speaks. So last week, we, we let you both come yeah. and introduce yourself, but just a reminder on that. Okay. Thanks. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, and I think that the idea that you have, even though not knowing how it's getting there, is a wonderful idea. I um, was a flood victim and went through the um, Red Cross and lost everything, and, and, and I understand and know how devastating it is, and I also know how devastating it is when so many people don't really seem to understand and I think it's great the reaching out because what happens with a flood is it only floods to a certain area or damages and then beyond that it's fine and people go back to, to normal and I know from having been through that the appreciation that I felt even weeks later of receiving help and assistance and clothes and shoes that fit at the time because you lose absolutely everything and um, I would suggest uh, the Red Cross perhaps as um, a possible liaison to get the materials down to where you need to go because there are a lot and also maybe possible area churches just because that's what is happening right now so just to urge a little bit more connection but you know I think that's that's wonderful it's a wonderful idea and a wonderful gift thank you okay um, thank you very much thank you again for your report Alex um, <coughs> so moving on to the agenda as I stated uh, earlier uh, we will be um, deferring the next item regarding school start time until the next meeting um, and then we'll move on to the next item which is a Did you have a question? Does that, mean we can't have discussion? that is my belief my belief is that um, I know there was some discussion about this um, the open meeting law concerns deliberation uh, deliberation by a public body on an issue uh, it's not just about a vote I know that there's been thoughts in the past that if you didn't take a vote you could still discuss something but I mean the, the crux of how public policy is made is the deliberation so I do not believe the, the count the, the committee can deliberate on this issue unless it's been posted properly I agree 
I so know. we could actually discuss just start time. We can't discuss anything else besides start, start time. time. We can't talk about the end time. Which is, so is that what you're saying? I guess what I'm well, what I'm saying yeah. and, and the point that was raised is that all of these proposals uh, before you about the start time on which you were planning to take a vote on tonight well. also impact the length of the school day, um, in particular at the elementary that school. We discuss. Okay. Um, so that's my belief is that we need to defer the issue until it's properly posted. Again, I believe it's a it's a technicality yeah. that we did not um, the, our language was not descriptive enough. I don't believe that it was the committee's intent to deceive anyone. I believe this issue has been widely publicized, talked about, etc. Um, uh, and again, in looking at ruling recent rulings by the attorney general, um, including against this body. <laughs> With regard to agendas, they've become very um, strict about it. So I don't want to take a chance. Um, would it be appropriate for me to suggest to school committee folks that if we have thoughts and feelings after tonight, or just in general, that we could not obviously we can't email each other and have a discussion by email, but but we could send suggestions or thoughts, whatever, to the superintendent. That we I think you can always communicate. So that he, uh, he just knows kind of where we. Stand in I terms think of if you want to send information to the superintendent, uh, that's fine. I just would, you sh I would encourage you not to obviously copy your colleagues on. So it. I, I would make that recommendation. <laughs> We've all heard. Um, there were half of us were at the forum last night, which I'm really pleased about. Um, we've all gotten emails and phone calls and all of yeah. that. And if if you're why don't we? Uh, I the superintendent made a good point. Was we, maybe we want to raise this under new business? New business, okay. Um, so that. Uh, just as feedback it's from the you're assigning me a new task, it would be new business. Not about assigning a task. Okay. I'm okay. Trying to help. Well, I guess I just want to be careful that we uh, that we don't well, we could start just talking about what we are not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about anything. I'm just going to recommend <laughs> that if anybody had any thoughts about anything that they wanted to share with the superintendent to help him prepare for the next meetings so that we're not delayed even further after that. Okay. No, I, good thing to do. I think that's all. It's always it's always appropriate if uh, you know if an individual school committee member wants to contact the superintendent with yeah. information. That's completely appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Of course, the superintendent will now have to be an informational black hole because we're <laughs> we're <laughs> each to relate even indirectly communications that he'd had that he could run into a potential. That could become. Serial it could turn into a serial communication. <laughs> that's correct. Under yeah. new business, however, we could discuss the idea of having a meeting between now and the next meeting. Yes. Yes. Certainly could. Okay. Certainly could. But we don't want to do that till under new business. Yes. Okay. Yes, that could certainly be discussed. Okay. <laughs> next. Okay, so uh, we'll move on then to the next item on the agenda, and that would be a vote on the acceptance of a gift of two thousand dollars <coughs> from Marcotte Ford. I vote to approve and accept the gift. I move to approve. So there's a motion Thank to you. Approve. And is that a second, Mr. Moore? Yes, that's a second. Okay. Um, I noted here, <coughs> Mr. Laughlin, you were. Uh, he needs to. He does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so no that's further explanation on that. Okay. That's just questions. Any questions about it? Okay. Uh, okay. All those in favor of accepting the gift of two thousand dollars from Marcotte Ford, say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. With gratitude. With gratitude. Thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, similarly a vote to accept a gift uh, from Gravity Switch, uh, which is a company here in Northampton. Uh, Seven thousand uh, dollars is the gift amount. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any questions or discussions? Mr. Bourne. I just had a. I noticed it's for um, for field trips and technology projects for the third grade. At Leeds, I'm just wondering how that grade was selected. Was that part of the gift, or how was that? Was that a grade with a particular need for field trips and technology, or the donor has a child in that yeah. grade? And uh, okay. To go with that grade. That doesn't seem right. That so benefits all the kids in third grade at Leeds. Um, so I, I did have some issue with this, and I, I did communicate with the superintendent about it because I. I'm I don't remember gifts being earmarked quite this specifically. I, and let me start off differently. 
with a lot of gratitude that I would uh, would wish to accept any any gift like this from from a parent and community member, um, and I don't want to be dismissive of that at all. I am concerned about setting a precedent for parents giving money to for great things for their kids' class. Mm -hmm. Actually, nowhere in here does it say that it has to be spent in this year while his kid is still in the third grade. So is that for third grade in any year? I mean, or and you know what I'm saying? So I, I just have some concerns about that mm -hmm. because people have given, you know, and and we're hoping that people will will contribute for technology, but into a, kind of a general technology fund. Um, we have. Um, parents who donate to their PTOs to help support field trips for their school. Um, but to give a, a large amount of money like this and then to say it's for, you know, for the benefit of this group mm -hmm. of 20 something s students. It's two classes. Right, two classes, right. so 40 something 40. students, but maybe 50 students. It's, it's, it feels a little tricky to me. Yeah, it's not fair. But I don't think this is something that we've actually seen before. Correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong. No. I'm, I'm just wondering what okay, just just so Actually, we were very cautious in past years. To, uh, I think at one point in time there was a school who wanted to solicit donations from their alumni, and we had some reservation about allowing that because we wanted to see equity district wide. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I do have a comment. I would agree with um, Ms. Pick. I think that to um, further separate socioeconomics for, those, for the, those who have and get to decide who does have and those who don't, even though it does um, benefit an entire classroom, I don't think it should benefit just one school or one grade. I, think it, I, I don't think it should be so specific. I don't think it's fair. I just don't think it's fair. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily an issue of fairness because it's uh, it's not coming from a we want to make one group better than the other. I think it's just if if you want to give money and you'd like to see it benefit um, the children in your child's grade, that makes sense. But I do think it does open up a lot of trick areas for if it does set a precedent that becomes a habit. Then um, there's issues with like class placement where these kids go, and so it's um, I can see this creating issues down the road um, and I think it's coming from a really good place so this is, this is not mm -hmm. um, and I, it, we're very appreciative of that but um, I can't imagine this might open up a can of worms somewhere down the line so just something to think about mm -hmm. uh, thanks See, was first. Mr. Moore thank you Mr. Moore my comment is just how much this echoes the speed bump um, debate that the city council had what was it two months ago um, Similar, really similar set of issues and similar set of concerns about you know, is, it, is it somehow cutting in line as opposed to is it really very supportive and in fact replacing. I think um, part of part of it is you know we we <laughs> we're just in the process of trying to figure out a technology plan for the whole district and finding out how it's going to be funded or if it's going to be funded. We have a technology plan, finding out if it will be actualized. And if this would then be able to be part of that technology plan, that would really alleviate a lot of the concerns about, you know, sort of the, the bar graph race between schools and classes and things like that. If, on the other hand, so it's very, again, it's just like the speed bump thing. If there was a budget for speed bumps, and so somebody gets their speed bump, that just means somebody else gets their speed bump that much sooner, that's not really a problem. If on the other hand there's no budget for speed bumps, so the only people who get speed bumps are the people who pay for them themselves, then that starts to be not really how we want to run a public entity. And um, so I don't actually know the answer to this question. I just think a tremendous amount depends on the context in which we, it is it's actually happening. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's just going to be part of $100,000 being spent on technology this year, then that's wonderful because then it's 107000 If on the other hand it's going to be the 7000 that's spent on technology yeah, this right. year, um, then, <coughs> that, then that raises many more of these questions, I think. Mr. Bourne? I was just going to say, I do think it's sort of a slippery slope. I mean, this is for $7,000, but what if it was 
fifty or hundred thousand dollars just for one grade at one school, I think we'd be questioning that. And the question is sort of where do you draw the line? Um, and I guess my other thought is, if it were to happen, I mean, if part of it is field trips, perhaps the donor could could arrange to do field trips on a weekend outside of school with all the kids. Or something like that. So it's not kind of working through the school. I do kind of have, a, have an issue with it just in terms of equity, I think. I mean, and again, it's in, incredibly generous, and I, I don't want to discourage donors. It's just kind of mechanics of how it works, I think, and kind of setting a precedent we don't want to set. Mr. Meyer? Um, a long time ago, I lived in Arlington, Virginia. And Arlington County has the southern part of the county that has a large immigrant population, um, economically less advantaged. North Arlington is um, very, very wealthy. And I was substitute teaching in a number of Arlington County schools. There was great disparities in terms of equipment, largely diff driven by private donations. Um, wealthier parents donated to the north part of the county. The parents in the south part of the county did not have the resources. Um, if we don't have a policy that addresses this, I think that we need one. Because it seems now that we have an extraordinarily generous family um, you know, Jason has given time and resources on the superintendent search committee. Uh, he's, you know, very active a parent. I see him on field trips. So this is coming from a very good place. But I would rather have a policy so that when someone approaches the superintendent or approaches an administrator, that w they can say to that parent, "We have a policy as a district that we operate as a district." That that for an there may be a, you know obviously when I give tissues to my you know, my teacher, my student's uh, teacher, that's one thing. But there may be a threshold over which we want to we want to try to encourage um, parents to think of our schools together. Um, because I, th I do think it has, you know, if this becomes a habit, it could potentially create equity issues between buildings. And this is, I, I think, Lisa, is, is there a policy on this or something similar? You just ask me that. Yeah. I know we have to approve gifts, but I'm not sure if This sounds really familiar, though. I think we we've had a conversation like this a few years ago. Like, there's, yeah, more than deja vu. I think this is, yeah, I think, I don't know. Sorry, I have not committed that manual to memory Come by on. now, but. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> I actually, I do remember that we have, I don't remember the details. Marking private donations, and I think that we have to look at that before we can accept this gift. And, and again, I certainly don't want to discourage donations, mm -hmm. but I'm really concerned about the precedent this, this sets. And mm -hmm. I would, um, if we don't have a policy, I would like to refer to rules and policy um, that we look at this issue, um, so that we are not we are not um, um, keeping from people from making generous donations like this, but that they have a clear understanding of what we can and can't accept. Them. Mm -hmm. So, um, it sounds like there might be a motion to continue this to the next meeting to allow for some research on the um, on whether or not a policy exists. Um, is there would, is that a motion you you would make? No, I think I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's a motion. I, I think okay. what I, I want is for um, the superintendent or to uh, assign somebody to look up what our current policy is. And if we don't have one that talks about private donations, uh, do you have access to it? Uh, it's policy KCD, public gifts to the schools. The school committee will have the authority to accept all gifts, including in-kind donations and offers of equipment for the schools when the gift is of educational value. All offers of the gift will be presented to the superintendent for review prior to the school committee approval. In case of gifts from industry, business, or special interest groups, no extensive advertising or promotion may be involved in any donation to the schools. If gifts would involve changes in school plants or sites, such changes will be subject to school committee approval. Gifts will automatically become the property of the school system. Any gift of cash, whether or not intended by the donor for a specific purpose, will be handled as a separate account and expended at the discretion of the committee as provided by law. The committee directs the superintendent to assure that an appropriate expression of thanks is given to all donors. And that's the only thing that I see for gifts under community relations section what K. It, what it said, if I heard you correctly, is that if somebody does earmark it, it's still, that, that's, it's still at the discretion of the committee? Yes, any gift of cash, whether or not intended by the donor for a specific person, will be handled as a separate account and expend, expend, expended at the discretion of the committee as provided by law. My recollection is that that probably was 
uh, and we often are given gifts um, in memory of someone, and those, <coughs> if they are a large enough quantity, they're left alone as their own line item, but we recently combined a number of smaller get bequests that have been given us into one lump and they were designed for scholarships for high school students many times it said this is for a student who did this or who's going to that kind of a school and in some cases they really were not even some, some of the particulars weren't even applicable anymore but we we finally just said if it's that, that we would just combine it all and that we would trust the principal and that the school committee would then approve whatever scholarship gifts were given I think it's been less frequent that we've had the kind of gift that we're discussing this evening mm -hmm. so. okay. I would hate to have <coughs> someone give us a gift I think the point of that particular clause was to say that it would be left in a separate line item in the gift you know as far as accounting is done I think they keep track of different lines so that they can subtract the money from that particular request but my concern again is um, the the accounting part of it is fine I'm not sure how a donor would feel with that mm -hmm. one phrase in there that says despite no, regardless of what you think you donated it for I don't, I'm not sure that that's mm -hmm intended to say that we could spend it however we wanted to I think it means that we have to have approval over the expense but it probably should be within the parameters mm -hmm. specified by the donor mm -hmm. but again I think that we need to maybe look at refining that policy to be clearer about what kinds of gifts we would accept Superintendent, I'd like to ask if you would be comfortable going back to this donor and discussing what our concerns were. Um, n not that we, that we're very grateful and that we really appreciate his intention, but that we're concerned about the inequity that could exist in the precedent mm -hmm. that's being set and if he could see his way to making his donation be a little bit more general, even if it's within the school. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do people seem yeah. to agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah. Did we need to have well there's a motion that's been made and seconded to approve the gift so you need to either withdraw the motion I'll withdraw the motion to approve okay. the gift and I okay. was second so then it's withdrawn and mm -hmm. and we'll um, defer this to uh, to a future meeting to bring back the gifts to a future it's one of those things you need that will help everybody. to refer this particular policy for review to the rules and policy mm -hmm. think that no, we I think you no. could do it on your own okay. We'll just do it. No, I just mean, policy. I think the committee could take it up as part of its business. Um, any other questions about this? So that has been withdrawn. Um, the next item is a vote uh, to request census data. And I'll ask the superintendent yeah. to explain this. This is an annual request. Uh, mm -hmm. The school committee needs to vote uh, to request the census data to be provided to the school committee from the city registrar. They provide it every year, but only at your request. So if you wouldn't mind uh, making a motion uh, for us to request the census data, um, if you vote to pass that, we can request the data and receive it, and we use it every year in our planning for early childhood and kindergarten. So moved. Second. <laughs> okay. Any questions about this? Hearing none, all those in favor of making the request say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that request will go forward. Next item on the agenda is the business manager's report. I'll turn it over to Mr. Waffle. Okay. Thank you. Um, business manager's report this month is fairly short compared to prior months. Um, just a, one, a couple of items just want to reiterate from last month's meeting. Uh, the October 1st numbers uh, for this year versus last year have increased by 34 students. Um, we we kind of glanced over a few things because of time last time. I think this is an important factor. Um, you do have the data. You do have the spreadsheets uh, from last month, but I just wanted to make sure I brought it forward to you again. Um, currently, uh, the uh, Department of Education, the formal end-of-year report, uh, we're working on it. Uh, the end of the year report now is complete. It's just needing signatures to get processed and have the, uh, the final wet signatures go to the Department of uh, Education. 
Um, our district is also scheduled for circuit breaker audit in December. We were going to be scheduled for that earlier this year in the month of August. It got postponed. We do have a new uh, special education director um, that gives the director additional time to prepare for this audit, and that will be happening in December. Uh, the uh, athletic department has rescheduled a number of their night meetings, as, as you heard earlier in some of the discussions, because of the Triple E warning. Um, the food service and athletic department uh, will be giving you next month a financial status uh, update of where they are this year, how they're performing, how many student participants uh, they have this year compared to the last year, how they think they're doing financially. So both uh, of those particular departments will be coming to you and making a presentation. The um, uh, next item under contracts, which you did approve, was uh, professional development for teachers uh, for $6,900. I just also passed out to you today. Um, I apologize for giving you hard copies. I'd like to make sure you have the electronic copy. We did have a couple of glitches in processing. Um, the goal is to try to get as many encumbrances as we can this year. We're still striving for that. Uh, this is the latest financial July, August, September, and October. The uh, final percentage of funds used states 31.7%. That's pretty much on target. Uh, <laughs> if you divide it out, our budget, we have a budget of 24 million and we spent 5.3, we've encumbered 2.2. We're pretty much on target with that percentage. Granted, a couple lines are gonna be uh, above or below. But uh, for the most part, uh, the overall budget is where we would like to have it. Um, also on financials, um, we're going to try to encumber more uh, areas within the budget, whether it's uh, maintenance, whether it's other types of expend expenditures. We're going to try to, again, get additional activities committed on purchase orders so we do have a financial obligation, so we know what our expended uh, position is earlier in the year so we're still striving for that we're still moving forward with that that's an ongoing process and if I can then jump down to my last topic is the capital planning process uh, I know during the month of October there's been a number of meetings uh, we did have a final meeting the other day in regards to uh, capital projects and in, in, in planning the uh, superintendent the uh, um, uh, technology director made a presentation uh, of all of our district technology needs as we move forward uh, it's the same information we talked about last month but we did have a very good uh, presentation uh, Mike, De De Mike Demon and Dave Pomerantz also outlined in detail our facility needs uh, what we need within our buildings what do we need on our grounds uh, other types of uh, equipment and uh, vehicles so overall, I think uh, as a school department, there were, it was a very good presentation. Uh, we did get the opportunity to vote. There's only so many people on the financial, uh, excuse me, the capital planning committee that vote and prioritize the capital projects. Uh, both Ed and myself are voting members on that committee. Um, the results of the suggested capital planning project list should be out next month and that uh, list will be presented to the mayor to be used going forward uh, in future planning. So th that rounds out the business manager's report. Two hands go up. <laughs> so Ms. Peck and then Ms. Duvall. Go for it. Questions. We have the same question, I betcha. <laughs> I, I have two questions based on the um, year-to-date report. Yes. Um, line item 1430. We're already over 100% legal. Uh, for legal for school committee. Um, no, we're not over 100%. 100.5? 100. Uh, at 100%. 100.5% used already. We've, in other words, we've used up all our fraud funds. We've committed them. Some we've already expensed, and some we have committed on purchase orders. For legal mm -hmm. for school committee? Yeah. I informed the committee last time that we did put a purchase order to uh, the firm of uh, Demoscus, and we booked $79,000 on a purchase order. Oh, okay. So this is the money to be, this is, this is right. the um, retainer. retainer fee. 
Yes. Okay. This is the entire expenditures. Okay. Okay. And um, not used uh, yet. Yeah. So really instead of instead of going through the year, waiting the individual for the expenses to come in, I've anticipated. Is, the yeah, you answered my question. It's the retainer. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on ninety three hundred, the non public tuition, at one hundred twenty point eight percent already. And so that's also tuition paid out ahead for the whole year? Even that one. Um, what that. we have is the known factors on the students right now that are being placed in out-of-district placements. Um, we've looked at their needs and we've identified the time and the amount of services <coughs> that are needed. And right now we've committed as many dollars as we could to know what our potential exposure is on purchase orders including what we've spent for July, August, and September. And then we've committed on a purchase order November through June. And when you add those two together, we're, we are a little bit ahead on that non-public tuition line, but we're also a little bit under on the tuition collaborative line. So they kind of offset. So I know that that's a moving target throughout the year with kids who leave and come in. Yes. OK, so that's, that's the amount that we're, we're Putting aside ahead for the placements that we already know about throughout the year. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. It's reassuring. Same question, same okay. issues <laughs> as uh, Ms. Pickout. Um, any other questions for the finance business manager for the finance report? Business manager report. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have two different reports that happen every other Thursday. So it's <laughs> come straight. Um, huh? Okay. Um, Hearing none, we'll get to the personnel report. The personnel report, I believe you have. Uh, again, you have uh, six. You have the new hires, and you have them all listed out. You have the separations, the retirements, and promotions and transfers. Again, identifying as much as we can from the positions, uh, the locations, and the effective dates as they have been turned into us. So you can see the activity that's happening throughout the district. Any questions about the personnel report? Okay. okay. Um, actually, it's not really personnel. It's just a, it's the position. Actually, um, what is a health education specialist? What is, what is that position? I don't have a job description for that. I don't know what it exactly <laughs> entails. So it's not the same as the health a health teacher at one of those you know at the high school or the JFK. I have to get back to you on that. Is it a position that's already been and and or is it new? I know. Yeah, these aren't new positions. It's not new, so it, somebody's well, already been in there. Replacing a position. No, I was just curious. Okay. It's a position yeah. I didn't know existed. Yeah. So that's why. Uh, uh, just the wording of that, that the title of it. Do you run the Prevention Coalition grant through the schools, the or Spiffy Coalition? I know Marissa yes. works oh, for that. Actually, Marissa, what it is? Marissa yeah. works for the prevention right, because we oversee the grant. Have, she we have a yeah. grant under the health services that falls under Karen. So that might yeah. be what so it is. I believe so she's, that might be part of the species. She, she, she definitely is because she works yeah. on the social yeah. norms campaign. So I, you know, I don't know if yeah. that's the title that's within the she's grant been or okay. it's within our local structure of how we hire uh, within the local budget. The fact that it's October accept 1st that it makes me really think it could be a federal fiscal year yeah. starting on a federal grant. Which we fit so, with. Yeah. Be part of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll move into the superintendent's report. All right. Just like to uh, once again thank you for supporting the late start where our teachers got to begin their work with their professional learning communities and that work was continued on Tuesday, our professional development day, as teachers were writing and reviewing curriculum and assessments. It was a day where we had uh, specific training targeted to specific people. So nurses, ESPs, teachers, special education professionals all had workshops specific to their needs. And it was one of our most comprehensively planned uh, PD days in a long time. I want to thank Joanna McKenna for her organizational skills, putting that together in her communication to find out what people wanted and needed and being able to bring that to them. Uh, um, it, it was a success. Uh, the PD days are getting better and we'll continue to improve them to meet the needs of our teachers as we go forward. Just a quick comment on the triathlon. You may have heard a lot about it and read about it in the paper, but I just want to comment on the commitment that these teachers made to train the camaraderie that uh, came together from it as they did workout sessions and preparing for this event. And then on the event, 
uh, day to have 75 people turn up and start and finish the race is extremely rare. And uh, I was very proud of everybody who did that. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to those teachers. A lot of them, this is their first athletic event ever. And uh, they were very proud of themselves, and we should be proud of them too. As Mark mentioned, the capital planning proposal, I wanted to mention that as well. Just because it's part of our district improvement plan, that was one of our goals that uh, we would make a presentation to the capital planning in the amount of $300,000 to improve and further our technology <coughs> needs. And so we'll just wait to hear uh, the result of that. Highlights at our schools at Bridge Street Elementary, this, uh, these highlights are from the late start, so you could know specifically uh, this is the first year that you gave us the time to do that, how this time was spent. At Bridge Street, the data team spent, um, uh, I'm sorry, in addition to the uh, late start, the data team at Bridge Street spent three days, including the late start day, working with the DSAC Research for Better Teaching Training in Lenox, Massachusetts. The data team learned the process of collaboration through inquiry and how data teams should use assessments to better and further student achievement. On the late start, the ESPs work together to design a consistent protocol for behavior during lunch and recess. It's a program that recognizes students for their positive behaviors and has a three-tiered model that works nicely with the three-tiered model of instruction. The classroom teachers also spent the morning beginning to align the math investigations program with the, core com with the common core standards, noting any gaps in investigations and looking at where we need to supplement instruction to make sure that investigation covers in depth what the common core standards require. Over at Ryan Road, uh, the classroom teachers, the Title I teachers and resource uh, people completed their analysis of the 2012 MCAS data identifying the outstanding strengths and weaknesses in grades three, four, and five, and are planning for interventions for the students for this year. Several staff members were trained in uh, the restraint training. Uh, kindergarten through second grade teachers learned how to use the document camera technology from one of their colleagues. And the ESP staff were led by two colleagues in aspects of the responsive classroom model. At Jackson Street, the late start session um, all ESPs and faculties met together in the library. They split up into three interest groups. Two of the groups were based on the reading of books and one is on the research into school-wide discipline programs. And all are connected and all relate directly to student success in school. The books are The Power of Our Words by Paula Denton, The Responsive Classroom Model, and the other is How Students Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character by Paul Tuff. The school-wide discipline programs that they looked at include the positive behavior intervention systems, responsive classroom, and peaceful schools. Over at Leeds, the kindergarten team worked on setting up a communication blog for parents, and the teachers were looking at data and creating their SMART goals. Um, they were, the second grade teachers were discussing sensory areas and other ideas for supporting the many second grade students with attentional and behavioral needs. At JFK, during the late start, the morning was a valuable and productive opportunity for professional learning and collaboration. English, math, science, social studies, history, world language, and special education teachers met in departments to begin the process of developing common standards-based benchmark assessments. The work focused on determining assessment type, question type, question content, and had the goal of implementing the first assessment at the end of the second quarter. This work continued during the Professional Development Day on November 6th and the special subject teachers participated in vertical team meetings with the Northampton High School colleagues. Their work focused on aligning curriculum and assessment. And likewise, guidance counselors met vertically with elementary colleagues to discuss the transition and how to support students from elementary to the middle school. Over at the high school, the teachers began the late start day with an introduction to professional learning communities with a presentation from our very own math teacher, Carolyn Gardner. Carolyn is in the doctoral program at UMass Amherst and is currently studying and teaching about PLCs. The NHS staff has worked collaboratively in coming up with topics they would like to discuss. The high school has 10 PLCs active right now in technology, advisories, healthy living, block scheduling, <coughs> data team, professional development, tiered instruction, co-teaching, crisis intervention, homework, and the capstone project. Carolyn pointed out characteristics of successful PLCs, and she stressed that this is not a committee, it's a way to look at student achievement through a different lens. 
Overall, I wanted to let you know that our administrators are continuing their instructional rounds work, and this week uh, teams were at JFK and Northampton High School. In health services, 130 students received the flu vaccine from our nursing staff during the flu clinic this week, and next week we will do staff vaccines. And one more highlight that the Northampton High School field hockey team is playing this evening for the Western Mass semifinals at West Springfield High School at 7 o'clock. They should be finished. If they win tonight's semifinal round, they move on to the finals. That will be on Saturday, and the times will be announced. A very successful season for those girls. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any questions? Well, I, that's the report. Um, we then have a new business is the next item on the agenda. Can I make a comment? Oh, certainly. I just wanted to comment on the triathlon. One, I wanted to congratulate you on kind of having the idea and, and implementing it and pulling it off as spectacularly as you did. I, um, I attended, I, just an observer, um, and it was so wonderful to see our um, administrators, teachers, staff participating in this all together as individuals or as teams. It, there was so much camaraderie out there. There was so much energy and um, um, support of each other out there. It was just spectacular to see. And I would really love to see the school committee have a team next year. Northampton mm. beat Minichok. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we won. Northampton beat Minichok three to nothing. We're in the final yes. Saturday. Yes, there we go. Besides me. I already did spelling. Oh, wow. Triathlon. Oh, the field hockey. So, um, any other questions? I, I just, I, I just want to echo what Stephanie said. I have heard nothing but amazing accolades about the triathlon and about the superintendent, um, and you know, moving this forward. Um, my son's third grade teacher participated in the triathlon, and she was a champion. And she can't help but tear up a little bit every time she talks about it. And the kind of connections that she made with other staff members on that day are so extraordinarily good for this district and um, I just want to thank you for spearheading that. So much fun. Okay, any other comments for the superintendent? Okay. The next item then is new business. Are there any items to discuss as new business? I think I can bring up new I do. Sure. <laughs> okay. What, what is the... I'd like to bring up the um, elementary school start time as, as far as for new business and that we had the forum the other night. So you'd like to bring up the last night's forum? Yes. Okay. And... and the, uh, well, I'm not really sure of the protocol here, but um, I was hoping last night that more people would have come who to discuss the elementary um, start time. And um, I just think that it's getting tied in with the bus schedule. However, it's been a philosophy of ours, I believe, that when we talked at the ALT meetings that we needed it for other reasons. And I've talked to elementary school teachers about. Um, so I think you're, I think you're now starting. The extended to day. The extended day. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is that getting into the waiting into the other? It, it is. I, I think. Okay. I think. Well, I just think we should err on the side of caution. Yeah. It comes to the open mm -hmm. meeting law. But I do uh, think that if the superintendent wanted to give us some information about if if you have any next steps after last night's forum, which we did not have 48 hours, we could not have anticipated feedback mm -hmm. or any ideas that he had from last night's forum, provided that they're, it, you know sort of administrative related, scheduling related, if you think there's another thing that needs to be scheduled or something like that, we need another form. you could make a comment on that. I, I think happy you could yeah. do that. I'd be happy to do that. After following as a, as a report of what happened last night. Yeah. All right, following the forum last night and given the uh, agenda issue today, I feel like we should schedule another meeting uh, soon before December. I don't think it's fair to have everybody wait another month. Um, and we, we should schedule another meeting to discuss how we want to go forward with the late start time and or the additional 20 minutes in the elementary. So then the recommendation would be to set aside a separate school committee meeting that would be uh, scheduled and posted for the specific purpose of, of a follow-up discussion of the start time. Yes, I think that you know works towards our goal of transparency and fairness and including the public and rather than having school committee members email me which of course you can do anytime 
Uh, on this particular issue, I feel we need to be as open and visible as possible when we're discussing it. Could I recommend that we look at um, November 29 as a five Thursday month, which means the mayor could actually be present as well? Possibly. You didn't hear I got kicked off the council on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, longer, no, no longer chairing the city council. Oh, right, the that started Actually, immediately? I, I still will need to probably need to attend some of those meetings, but I'm no longer chairing. The school committee, right? It says? <laughs> <laughs> First free Thursday <laughs> ever. Is all the charter changes are immediate? Well, I, I, I'm going to get off topic. Yeah. I was going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, also, anyway, even so, maybe another new could, could, is that a Thursday that we can look at? Thursday the 29th? Yeah. Well, what Thursday would you like to look at? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be out of town on the 29th. I will too. Is there any requirement that we meet on Thursdays? That if not, if it's a special meeting, um, then could I recommend that you have, um, um, and he send out a, a Google or calendar. A calendar for us to come up with a date rather than calendaring here. Mm -hmm. Sure. And hopefully one that the TV people could attend so that yeah. it's it's out there for, for people to see, for transparency. Okay. So then. Uh, Thank you. We'll follow through on trying to set something like right. that up. Okay. And so the idea would be that there would be just one agenda item on that special meeting. It would be the, this discussion of the late start and or the extended elementary time. Yeah. I'll, I'll, find, I'll work on the wording. A discussion point as you right. could. I will. But it will be just a single agenda item. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Do people agree with that? I like any, that. Any? <clears throat> Um, the only other uh, just quick new business item I wanted to raise was, in fact, the fact that the, um, the, the voters of the city had adopted the new charter on Tuesday. Um, and as part of that, the city solicitor is working on um, going through it and trying to come up with some transitional, uh, some plans regarding transition. There's some stuff that happens immediately, and then there's other stuff that, that will go into effect after um, certain committees do some additional work to look through our ordinance books, et cetera. Um, but there are some issues that will affect the school committee and the school department um, and will change some yeah. of our processes. So uh, I think we'll need to um, have figure out a way that we can have a discussion of that or perhaps have rules and policy look at it. Um, particularly in the budget area, it's going to have a, an impact because of the way that the budget, um, the whole city budget is, is uh, will be sort of restructured in that um, there'll be at the beginning of the year there will be a kind of an overall budget meeting that that meeting that used to happen at the end of the cycle where the school committee and the city council and the mayor and everyone would kind of get together actually now happens at the beginning of the mm -hmm. process which I think actually it's makes sense better. so there's an attempt and the, and the mayor presents kind of an overall budget forecast at that point um, so that when the school committee and the city council then go off the budget process they all kind of start with that same baseline of information but it also is going to require a much more front-loaded in terms of the deadlines for when the school committee will have to pass a budget mm -hmm. um, and that will ha actually happen before the city passes the overall budget um, the sequencing the way that will mm -hmm. work so we're j it's just gonna so we'll we'll try to get some information out to the school committee um, but it, but there's also going to be some issues that we may will require looking through some of the city uh, I keep saying city council, school committee rules and procedures to make sure they align with the uh, the current charter. Mm -hmm. So that's just an FYI. Could I ask, do, you, do you happen to know? Does the it's a Alden one? <coughs> Sorry, Steph, Alden. after Stephanie. Uh, do you happen to know? Does the um, charter um, um, where the charter doesn't match where, what our bylaws currently say, does that make the, those bylaws null and void? Yes, it does. And, okay, so so that means that you are now in charge of naming all um, c c subcommittees. That's what the charter says, yes. Okay. Um, can we as a committee make a decision other than that, or that's, that's, that's final and we can't? Um, the, 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 the charter controls any ru rules, ordinances, bylaws, etc. It, o it yeah. overrules the bylaws altogether. It does. So, in other words, you could not delegate to someone else. 
that. Um, I guess I'd have to study that. Those are some of the issues we have to look at. Yeah, those are some of the issues that we have to study. Yeah, as, as this was sort of brought in line with other charters around the state, that is one of the issues that, that frankly, I didn't even see until uh, toward the end of the process. Um, but typically, the chair of a committee is in charge of naming the committees. Um, so the chair of the, the chair of the city council is in charge of naming the committees. Um, so I think that's the that's why it was aligned that way to match. It seems to me that it was actually unmatched, but we'll debate that another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The charter didn't address it before. There were those. Yes. I thought our bylaws addressed it because the charter. Didn't You're correct. The ch yeah. And that was, I think, one of the deficiencies of the charter that it didn't. There were lots of things like basic things about the school committee, basic things about the city council that were sort of vague and, and were left to rules and ordinances. So that's now pretty more clearly defined. Yeah. So we can, we'll get more information about that. But def the budget thing is probably the more pressing thing because it's going to require, um, it's going to require more, sort of a more front-loaded process for all of us. Mm -hmm. So, and I have to submit a budget by a certain date. I also have to submit a capital plan by a certain date as well. Mm -hmm. But it does uh, keep us in line with the practice of many other cities in the government. Oh, uh, most definitely. Yeah. Most it's, definitely. Yeah. You described it to me as a very similar process to what we use in the city of Newton. Exactly. It's actually yeah. much more common than mm -hmm. the process we had. And frankly, we didn't have a process delineated in our charter. Mm -hmm. It was not anywhere in our charter. Um, but those that's much more common to have a budget process clearly laid out in mm -hmm. the charter. Right. So. OK, so more on that coming. Well, oh, I'm oh, sorry. I got my question. Sure. Thanks. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, future business meeting dates, uh, rules and policy to be determined, capital planning to be determined, and obviously we may have a, f a special school committee meeting to be determined. Um, is um, I thought we had November 14th at 1:30. Do we not have that? I thought she told. For me. rules no. and policy, we don't have that. So we have nothing still. I would like to encourage <laughs> us to be able to meet more often. <laughs> it is hard to coordinate. Now yeah, well, well, there's only what three of us on this on a committee. It's because we have several administrators that need to be in attendance as as well at that particular meeting. So it's getting everyone together at one time. But I think it's important that we have more uh, meetings more often. And, and when we're having such a difficult time, I mean, we went through October and rescheduled to November, and now November 14th, which I had, isn't there. I mean, how far? It just seems to me that it's getting too far apart for the meetings to be effective. We'll be working on that calendar first thing tomorrow. <laughs> I would now. Um, we come to that point in the agenda where I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? So Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned. Okay.